Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us now, for it is evening. And the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness. And shine within your people here. Joyous light of heavenly glory, loving glow of God's own face. You see creation's story shine on every land and race. Now as evening falls around us, we shall raise our songs to you. God of daybreak, God of shadows, come and light our hearts on In the stars that grace the darkness, in the blazing sun of dawn, in the light of peace and wisdom, we can hear your quiet song. Love that fills the night with wonder, love that warms the weary soul, love that bursts all chains asunder, set us free and make us whole. You made the heavens splendor, every dancing star of night, make us shine. Gentle justice, let us each reflect your light. Mighty God of all creation, gentle Christ to light our way. Loving Spirit of salvation, lead us on to endless day.
May our prayers come before you, O God, as incense, and may your presence surround and fill us so that in union with all creation, we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. Our first reading is from Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? The Holy Gospel according to Luke. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been, inv been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you might come to say, Give this person your place, and then in disgrace you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes to you, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they might invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous." The Gospel of the Lord. Now, anyone who has ever planned a wedding banquet understands the intricacies and etiquette of how everyone is supposed to be invited and seated. I was thinking back to my wedding, which occurred in my early 20s during the season of many different weddings of friends and family, and my aunt and uncle confided in me all these weddings, they always seat us with aunt and uncle X. And I confided back in them because I had just completed my seating chart in which they were seated next to aunt and uncle X. That's because you're the only one who can get along with them. Luke loved to write about meals. He wrote about Jesus eating, being served, preaching about meals, miracles involving food. In fact, one-fifth of all of the sentences in the Gospel of Luke have to do with food. It's a powerful container for a spiritual metaphor, for, being, for talking about how our spirits are fed or are hungry. But also, meal stories highlight the disparities of the culture, the social differences that were important at that time. The intricacies and etiquette of first century Greco-Roman culture were even more significant than our wedding norms of today. Jesus was invited up to a Pharisee's house. Now, Jesus was poor, but of great stature because of his teaching. Only those of the highest stature were even invited, and there was an expectation of reciprocity. It's going to be somebody else's turn to host the next week. And then there was the seating chart. This is not about seating at an Uncle X with whoever could stand to be around them, but they sat in the rank of importance. The most important person sat next to the host, down to the least important. And Jesus first calls to mind the honor and shame culture when he instructs the guests to humble themselves. To be reseated below their current seat would be public embarrassment and humiliation. Humility was not a virtue in this early culture, but at least it allowed them to save themselves from shame. But then Jesus turns to the host and all of those present would be hosts at one time or another, so really he was speaking to all of them. 
He turns the tables now, just like he is apt to do, dismissing this whole practice of these meals of the elite. He reversed the societal expectations, like Luke loves to tell us about again and again. And he says, you should invite the poor, crippled, lame, and blind. No one that these Pharisees probably knew or would ever associate with. But Jesus' unspoken expectation was even greater than what he did say. Perhaps at this very Sabbath, the meal that they were um, celebrating, as they worshipped, maybe those gathered had read from the scroll of Micah that evening. Certainly they knew it, even if they hadn't read it that day. And they knew that in the time that the prophet Micah wrote, Israel had a very strained relationship with the Lord. They asked, what do you want from me? Micah says, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 10, rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What do you want, God, my firstborn child? Professor Amy Ogden writes, Rather than offer God thousands of rams, Micah calls us to offer a thousand daily acts of love for each other and for the world God loves. Walking humbly with God means knowing our bent to self-righteousness. We cannot play church or frame religious life as a game where we keep God in check by performing prescribed duties. The life of faith is a walk that reorients heart and life. Jesus puts the Pharisees' social practice in direct contrast to their calling as the people of God. Doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly are not things that we can just check off of our list. They're a way of life. Discipleship is not a thing we do. It's someone we become. And we don't just invite the outcasts of society to dinner because they can't repay it. We do it because of a humble heart that always puts others before ourselves. I've had the opportunity... <clears throat> to um, participate in a ministry called Spoke Folk. It's a, um, a ministry for youth and young adults where we bike between churches and put on a musical program. And we spend all morning um, biking half of the route. We meet up at a park and have lunch. And I've directed um, these tours before and it was my practice to get in line last to eat lunch. Now, I could have gotten in line first because I may have had some phone calls to make with our next host church or somebody, something to check on just to make sure that our arrival was um, going to go smoothly or our route was laid out as planned. But I chose to go last because I wanted to make sure that everyone had a chance to eat and rest. If I ate last and I had time to eat my food and digest it and get a little break from all the biking we had done in the morning, then I knew that everyone else had had that opportunity. And while I was standing at the back of the line, I had a chance to check in on all of our participants, make sure that they were eating well, drinking their water, and taking care of themselves and each other. Now, I wonder what would happen if I brought this humility to the rest of my life? What if I saw everyone around me as my com community who I needed to protect and ensure their well-being? What if I put them in line in front of me every time because I wanted to make sure that they got enough? Well, then that would be an, not an act of choice, but a humble way of life. I encourage myself to start thinking that way and you as well as we think about who we are in light of who Jesus is. Our humility, our walking humbly with God is a life, a personality, a trait that we become, not just something that we do. Amen. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. An angel went from God to a town called Nazareth to a woman whose name was Mary. The angel said to her, Rejoice, O highly 
great and merciful God, source and ground of all goodness and life, give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless our God. Praise and